Thank you for coming back on time. Our final speaker is Prof. Alessio Figali. He's joining us virtually today, and his talk is entitled Optimal Transport Math and Beyond. The Q&A session will be moderated by Prof. Yao Yao. Prof. Figali, please. Oh, thank you very much. So it's a, a great pleasure and honor for me to be here, even if though virtually. Um, so today, I would like to talk about um, uh, optimal transport and beyond, as the math and beyond, as the title says. So it's about optimal transport. Uh, I already gave some lectures in the past about this, but today I would really like to focus more on the beyond part. So I will briefly introduce for you um, the optimal transport problem, how it was, or how it originated, uh, what mathematician did at the beginning, but then we will really move. Uh, um, rather straight away to applications to show you also some maybe a bit more recent develop developments on the theory. So um, the optimal transport problem originated with Gaspar Monge. So we are back in during the French Revolution and Napoleonic area. So we talk about um, 230 years ago now. And uh, essentially Napoleon uh, Monge was moved by military applications. So the idea is that you, you know, you want to do a military campaign and you will have to build fortifications, let's say across Europe, if you wanted to do a military campaign in Europe. And you have uh, places, uh, so mines where you extract soil and you start material to build fortifications. And the question is, uh, how do I do it in an efficient way, right? So I have all this material and I want to transport it around and I want to do it in the cheapest possible way. So here is a, the, what my goal is to do it uh, with the minimal transportation cost. And uh, what do I mean by that? So again, you see this movement of particles that are go and let's say transporting material as a cost. It could be cost because I have to pay for it. It could be cost because people have to do it, uh, even if we don't pay them, but still like military could do it, but uh, still it has a cost in terms of value. And um, so Monge studied this problem. He, he was focusing really on the, um, on the military application. In his mind, he said, okay, how much it cost me to transport? Well, the transportation cost for Monge was proportional to the distance, travel distance. So he thought that a good modeling assumption was that if I have to transport material between two cities, which are, let's say, 100 kilometers apart, and uh, I don't know, I move one kilogram of material between two cities, I pay, um, within two cities which are 100 kilometers apart, I will pay 100. But if the two cities are a thousand kilometers apart, I will pay a thousand. So I just pay proportional to the transportation, to the distance. And of course you will pay also proportional to the mass you transport. But let's say at the level of just how much it costs me to move a unit of mass. So one kilogram, let's say is my unit of mass from one place to another, I will just pay proportional to the number of kilometers that this material has traveled. Um, this may look a very, simplifying assumption. I mean, that perhaps it's not so realistic, but you know, already in this case, there is a lot of very beautiful mathematics that you can do. Uh, you can try to understand the geometry of the optimal transport. You can ask yourself, does it exist? An optimal way to do it. If it exists, how it looks like. So Monge actually did a, a lot of, made a lot of beautiful uh, and remarkable observations that allowed him essentially to fully understand the geometry of the optimal transport problem in two and three dimensions, which of course are the one physically relevant. Um, then essentially for 150 years, not much happened until in the 1940s, um, Leonid Kantorovich, so we have to move from France to Russia now, studied Monge problem and in a different way. So the idea is that for Monge, you know, you had material in one place and you will just transport it to a different place. So let's say my unit of mass was one kilogram. But then once you, you fix your unit of mass, the idea was that this unit of mass was indivisible. In the, in the mathematical formulation of Monge, Monge was not allowed to say that, okay, I have a, a kilogram of material and I'm gonna send alpha kilogram on one place and alpha kilogram some, somewhere else. Um, of course, he could do it if he had two kilograms because it was twice the unit of mass. But in a sense, once you block the unit of mass, it was not, his mathematical modeling was not uh, flexible enough for him to split masses. And this was a drawback mathematically because it, of course, it was not uh, allowing him to solve a problem like the one depicted in this picture, right? Because you have maybe bakeries and coffee shops 
bakeries produce bread and coffee shops want to buy bread. And so there is a demand, so there is an offer and a demand, right? And your goal is to draw arrows, you see as in this picture, so that in the end the total transportation cost is the least possible. So this is a, an economical problem where uh, you see there is no competition. So it's not like uh, I can adjust my price, I can uh, whatever, do competition between bakeries and coffee shops. No, 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 there is no competition. All the, the goal is cooperation here. We just want to, all the bread that is produced has to go to the different coffee shops and we want to optimize, have a global optimization problem so that the total transportation cost is the minimal. And so what will happen naturally is that maybe a bakery will bake, I don't know, four kilograms of bread, but maybe two, two kilograms will go somewhere, 300 grams will go somewhere else, 500 grams somewhere else and so on. So you have to split the, the amount of material you produce into different subunits, which could be arbitrary. And, uh, and then you just have this optimization problem where these arrows have to beat the, the demand and uh, the offer. So of course, each coffee shop in the end has to receive all the bread that it needs, and each bakery has to sell, has to send, let's say, all the bread that produces. Um, Kantorovich, so in the sense he developed the mathematical theory to study this problem. He transformed the optimal transport problem in a convex optimization problem. So this was uh, something at the, at, the at the theoretical level, extremely important because then even if you wanted to find a, a, a numerical solution of optimal transport, you could do it efficiently because there were, with time, you know, people developed a lot of tools to study convex optimization problems. And in fact, Kantorovich received uh, for this work, the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, in, 1950, in 1975. So, you know, the impact of this work has been really remarkable. Um, so this was, let's say, just the beginning. Uh, now from 1980s on, so in the last 40 years, mathematicians have started really to focus a lot on optimal transport. And by now, there is a lot of mathematical theory on optimal transport, which essentially allows you to say, okay, I have this problem, I have this distribution of material that I want to transport to this configuration. The cost is this one. And I can tell you essentially, yes, there is an optimal transport. No, there is not an optimal transport, more or less how it looks like and so on. So I will not spend time on this because this is an old story. I just would like to say that the, what we learned until now is that the choice of the cost plays an important role. So for Monge, the, uh, the cost was the distance. So this cost between two points is just the Euclidean distance. For most of the applications, actually, uh, some I will discuss here, some I will not, but most of the applications in general, actually, people realize that uh, the one, want, one may want to minimize the kinetic energy, actually. So, uh, you know, kinetic energy of, of a particle is one half velocity square. And then if you think that, you know, velocity time, I mean, if you multiply, if you integrate in time, uh, you know, velocity becomes distance and then uh, you have X minus Y square. So X minus Y square is just the uh, integral in time of the kinetic energy. So, um, so that's a very physically relevant choice of the cost. There are more choices, of course, but these are the two, let's say, most classical ones. And uh, now, if you are really interested in the original Monge problem, where he said, I want to transport material between cities, which is a very natural, in, okay, Monge wanted to transport, uh, to build fortification, but think about just saying, I have goods, and I want to transport goods from one place to another. And uh, what's the cost? Well, the cost should take into account the geometry of the space, right? So for Monge, the cost was just the distance. So number of kilometers, but you know, uh, if there are mountains, if there are valleys, if there are lakes, of course, traveling hundred kilometers can be way more complicated than if I am in, in a region where everything is flat and you know, there is no geographical obstruction to, to go from one place to another. So the cost cannot be just the Euclidean distance. You need something a bit more, in, evolved, let's say involved. Uh, but by now I would like to say that all these questions are well understood. So there is a very robust mathematical theory. Now, just to put things in perspective, how broad is optimal transport actually is extremely broad. Um, so over time, we found a lot of applications. So of course, the most natural application you can have in mind is urban planning. It's the first uh, example I have in my slides. So why urban planning, right? Because 
planning, um, urban planning, what does it mean? I, I want to build a city and I want to do it efficiently in some way. And what could be an optimal transport problem? Well, I my I know where people live, so I know the distribution of the population, and so where are the houses and the density of population. I know where the offices are, so I know the density distribution of offices and perhaps uh, across the cities or some locations, whatever. And I want to build infrastructures across the cities so that uh, people can commute in the shortest time. Of course, again, it's a global optimization problem. I don't expect everyone to be happy there, but the total commuting time will be, I can try to make it as minimal as possible. So it's always about global optimization here. Um, there, is, there are <clears throat> actually physical examples in meteorology. Meteorology of, you know, movement of clouds in there and clouds move over time and uh, clouds are made of particles. And what happens in some, in some meteorological models is that you can discover that the way particles inside clouds move is optimal in the sense that they do it by minimizing some transportation costs. So if I have a cloud and I look at the same cloud one second later, it, the particles will have moved from the first configuration to the second one and they will have done it optimally. Optimal in the sense of optimal transport. Um, in biology, that's very natural. Biology is optimal again. So if you think about a, a tree that has to bring nutrients from the ground to the leaves, it does it uh, in a kind of optimal transport way. So it, there is a transportation effect where you have all these nutrients that come, that go uh, through the roots and then up uh, through the tree and then the branches and so on. And you can find some optimal transport problem to model that. So there is a there are very, several ways to use optimal transport to model this kind of biological phenomena. Um, another one which is relevant and just to, to mention this, so these other two examples will just tell you something about image processing that's interesting. So about images, you know, uh, the moment you decide to transport something and you make this a mathematical theory, um, you can transport everything you want because Mathematics, I mean, once you make things object abstracts, it doesn't need to be a, a real object. So you have in mind that we can move objects, we can move, you know, bread and so on. But perhaps one thing that I could do is to say, I have an image and an image is made of pixels. And maybe I have two images, so two configuration of pixels. And I can ask myself, can I transport the first image to the second image? Which means just transporting pixel from one place to another, perhaps paying a certain cost, depending whether the color of certain pixel is different and so on, right? So I can think of transforming images or let's say going from one image to another as a transportation problem where I have to, you know, move histograms of colors, move pixels and so on. And then I can ask myself, what's the transport, what's the total transportation cost? And if the transportation cost is very little, it means that my two images looks very similar. And uh, if not, otherwise they're not similar. So perhaps if two images are similar, they're representing more or less the same object. Okay, so if you think about image recognition, do you see a car, do you see a cat, do you see a dog? What do you see in this image? If you know that two images have low transportation cost, perhaps they're representing the same image. So in image processing, you can think of transport as a tool to compare images. Okay. With this, you know, kind of um, preliminary con considerations, um, I, could, I would like to mention you some recent applications. What else can you do with optimal transport? So these are all examples coming from the last uh, nine years. So first, GANs. So GANs is, is a, 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 so these are gener generative adversarial networks were introduced a few years ago. And essentially it's like a, a game that the two um, computers or neural networks, if you think in terms of machine learning, play between each other. And the goal is the following. So you have, a, in this picture, you have, look at us just at the two boxes. There's a G and a D. G is a generator, D is a discriminator. So the generator will be my um, uh, neural network or whatever. So let's say, think of a computer that is generating images. So this computer has been trained to generate fake images. So what has, not, what has happened is that uh, uh, this computer has seen a lot of, of images, let's say of dogs, and, um, 
and after so seeing billions of them, now he is able to just generate new ones. Okay. On the other end, you have a discriminator, and the discriminator role is to decide whether an um, an image is a true image or a fake image. So you see, there is this kind of in the in the slides. You see, there is uh, there is the gene. Oops, sorry, I moved. My mistake. Uh, so in the slides, you see there is the generator, and on top of the generator, these are these real samples. So what you do is that you start to give to the discriminator images. Sometimes they come from the lim fake images that have been generated uh, by the generator. Sometimes you give him real samples. And then the discriminator every time has to say, oh, this is a real image, this is a fake image. And now what happens is that if the discriminator is correct, you give the feedback to the generator. You say, hey, the generator, you gave a fake image. You gave a fake image to the discriminator. The discriminator realized that this was fake, which means you have not been good enough. You need to improve. So new training has done on the generator to improve. Instead, if the discriminator has been wrong, the feedback is given to it and say, hey, you're not being good enough to discriminate. This was a fake image. You thought it was real. So take this as a as a new learning lesson for the next situation. So there is this kind of optimization, joint optimization, where they send, so they're playing one, one against each other, but by playing, the feedback that they get from the outcome make them optimize in some sense. Uh, this was what uh, GANs are doing. So you need two um, neural networks, two computers in sense, the discriminator, discriminator, but in sense what um, few years later, like in 2017 and then in a later work on 2019, people said, well, I don't need the discriminator. In fact, yeah? I just need generator plus buses and distances. So plus, let's say, a buses and distance, which means uh, optimal transport. It's just another way to say optimal transport. Um, what do I mean by that? So you you generate, so this G theta is, this, is like a map that generates, that tells me how to generate images. Um, so I have this bunch of images that are generated. Theta is a parameter that is my optimization parameter, so it's my freedom. I have to change, choose theta so to make images as good as possible. So I have a, a theta is a, is a, num, is a vec, is some object that lives in a very high dimensional space, and I can choose theta. So depending on the theta, I will, give, I will get different images for each theta. And the goal is that the set of images that I get is as faithful as possible. So in this picture, new, the measure new represents the, the real images. New theta represents the fake images with, generated with parameter theta. And my goal is to optimize theta so that the fake images are as close as possible to the, to the real images in the sense of transportation distance. So in the sense of optimal transport. So you see, you have this huge distribution of real images, this huge distribution of fake images. This huge distribution depends on theta, and then the goal is choose theta as best as possible. So you avoid in this way the, the double optimization. You only have to optimize in one parameter theta. You don't have the, to use a discriminator. You can just use optimal transport to, to understand how good is the approximation. So uh, this is what Vassens and Gans are, and uh, they just use, as I say, optimal transport to, to, to identify closeness between images, which is why I, I described this example before. And it's a very nice and useful tool. Just to, to tell you how good these problem, programs are, just very quickly, these, is, these are three dogs. And I can tell you that out of these three dogs, two are fake and one, only one is real. Which, I don't know, if you just look at it quickly, it's rather remarkable. If you look at details, perhaps you can identify which one is the real one. But uh, it's rather remarkable that only one is a real dog and the other two are fake. Um, so just to go on, um, there is another application, for instance, very recent, started in 2019 with Schimmel Gareth's co-authors, um, about single cell genomics. So this is a situation where you have cells that evolve over time. So you have to think that, you know, if you take cells, there is always a, the cells change over time. For instance, that's how tumors grow. And you want to understand the process that guides uh, this differentiation of, of cells during development. And it's very difficult to do that. 
So there have been like theoretical models to understand this cell dif uh, differentiation. And this is called, uh, this is this picture that you see in the background. This is like this landscape, like these cells move through this landscape over time. And you know, perhaps there are valleys and mountains, and then this, this landscape is what guides the cell dif um, differentiation. So this is a model called Waddington uh, landscape model. And what people have done is said, okay, through this model, I can perhaps guess what's going on. Fine. So the, the landscape you have to discover what it is. So you don't you know that you you predict that there is a landscape. You don't know how it looks like. Uh, but the real problem here is the following: you have your bunch of cells, let's say, and you have them at day one. Then you have them at day two, and then at day three, and so on. And then each time you would like to observe them to see what has happened. Did they change? Has there been mutation? Uh, so what do you say? You take a bunch of them and you do measurements so to see what happened. But the moment you do measurements, what do you do? You have a bunch of, you say, billions of cells, and you take a part of them that you think are representative enough so that they give you enough information, and then you put them in a microscope or whatever to make to understand what's going on. But the moment you take them out of the living body where they are mutating, then they die. So it means that uh, you cannot really observe the full distribution of cells because if you observe all of them, you will kill your um, the body that you're observing. So you're only allowed to take a small sample of them. And you know that every time you take a small sample, this sample is gone from your uh, from your data set because you killed that cells. This is why you cannot do too many measurements either. You can say, oh, I take samples of cells very, very often, and I take a lot of them because then otherwise you kill everything <laughs> very quickly. So in a sense, you have little data. That's the problem. You cannot sample too often, and you cannot sample too much. And still, you would like to predict what's going on over time. And then what you could think is that you can use optimal transport. So this is what the uh, shipping and this code are called what it on optimal transport. So uh, combining this landscape model with optimal transport, you could try to identify the trajectories. So you say, OK, at time t1, you see I have these distribution points, like mu t1 in the picture. Then at time t2, I have these other distribution points. But how the points from time one to time T2 moved from one configuration to the other. So what happened in between? Well, you can think that they, they have been transported and they have, they have followed an optimal transport path. So they moved in an, some optimal transport way. So perhaps close by points have gone to close by points or something like that. So the optimal transport can try to re, re, allow you to reconstruct the trajectories. Of course, in all this picture and all these examples, I'm never mentioning what do I mean by optimal transport in the sense that if you change the cost, the optimal transport changes. So optimal transport is linked to the choice of the cost. And this is another big question, like which cost should you take to reconstruct trajectories? So this is another story. Um, it's not easy. Uh, you can try to make guesses. You can try to use uh, artificial intelligence to guess what are reasonable choices and so on. There are many, there is a lot of research going on there. Um, but let's say in all this problem, there is a macroscopic macro problem above everything, which is um, numerical complexity. So fundamental question, if you want to do anything from an applicative point, point of view, you have to be able to be to quickly solve optimal transport. Like, okay, I want to solve the optimal transport problem between two densities. I want to know what is the cost between two densities. I want to do it quickly. I need an answer quickly if I have to do millions of billions of measurements and, you know, um, a lot of, uh, you know, I have to solve this problem many, many times. Now, if you just use the Kantorovich formulation, the fact that this is a convex optimization problem, and let's say you want to transport n points to n points, then, uh, you know, theoretical, uh, classical theoretical results about the convex optimization problem tells you, okay, you can do it in n cube computational cost. So if you have n points, you can do it in n cube. Uh, that's too much. If you think about a pixel, uh, the pixel in a picture, I mean, a pixel of the order of millions, and then mil, uh, order of million or 10 million to the cube. And then you have to do this measurement many, many times. It's really out of control. So this n cube is way too much. So the, the question is that how can I make something better? So here there is a, a, a big important point I would like to emphasize. 
you can try to say, I'm, I'm going to find the algorithm which is theoretically the best possible. I want to put this number and cube as low as possible as I can with better algorithms. Um, or you can say, I want to find an algorithm which from a theoretical viewpoint is not as efficient as others from a theoretical viewpoint, but the moment I put in a computer, actually it works way better than anything else. So here there is always a difference between the best theoretical algorithm and the best practical algorithm. So I would say that uh, at the moment there is a mismatch. In the, sense that the ones that people currently use are not the ones that are theoretically clearly more efficient, but in application they are better. Because you always have to think that, you know, uh, from a theoretical viewpoint, you know, you go from n to n cube, what matters is the power. But suppose that uh, I tell you the transportation, the, how much computational cost I need to do something. And then in one case, I tell you, okay, if you want to compute with this algorithm, you can do it with n cube, but, but exactly n cube, no constant in front. And then there is another algorithm that it takes n square, but there is a, multi, a constant in front of n square, which is of the order to, I don't know, 10 to the uh, 20. So 10 to the 20 times n square. Of course, from a computer point of view, this 10 to the 20 kills everything. So even if you have a better power, the constant in front matters. So there is always a this mismatch between theory and application. It's also always a matter of, okay, is it really, it's not only the power, I need also the constant in front, okay? Now, there are many algorithms, but the, I will say one of remarkable idea that was introduced by Kuduri and then developed by Kuduri and Pere is entropic regularization. This crucially improves computational costs. You can very efficiently compute optimal transport at the expense of a small error, okay? So they don't compute exactly optimal transport, they compute an what they call entropic optimal transport. It's optimal transport up to some epsilon error, Epsilon is the regularization strength. So it's like saying I have my measures mu and nu, and solving optimal transport will be like finding a, a line in this square, which is telling you how points move. This is like a this line represents the graph of the optimal transport, but it doesn't matter. Let's say that optimal transport is like finding a line. And then in the entropic regularization, I don't find a line, I find some blurry version of it. Okay, fine. That's good enough for most applications. Even if it's a bit blurry, I can compute many things. That's the very vague idea. Now to conclude, I would like to mention a couple of more things. So uh, there have been uh, applications, digital questions like neural networks and gradient flow. So for instance, neural networks, what is a neural network? Like there is a very simple case, which is single layer neural network. So you have uh, inputs. So you have data that kick in in your first layer. Then some operations happens in between two layers, and then you get an output. And then in the operation that happens in the in between are just very simple operations, just some linear transformation, well, a fine transformation, let's say, between one layer and another. And the goal of in, uh, in training a neural network is to find numbers, theta one to theta n, that tells you how strong is the connection between two neurons. You have to think this like as a brain, neurons are connected, between one layer and another, and theta n represents the intensity of the connection between different neurons. And then you ask, I want to choose theta n, this theta in the most efficient way. So you can think of this as a huge string of numbers, or you can build a probability measures out of it, which is just sum of Dirac deltas at theta i normalized by one over n. And if you take this interpretation, so not of string of numbers, but probability measures, then you can use you know, optimal transport is about transporting densities. So about transporting perhaps also probability measures. So optimal transport is very efficient to tell you how to make probability measures move and evolve in time. So the training of a single layer neural network can be reinterpreted as a gradient flow in some optimal transport sense. Uh, just for, com for completeness, I give you like the vague formula that this is like the evolution equation that this measure has to satisfy to train your neural network. And these kind of uh, formulas are very common in optimal transport. Uh, unfortunately, this interpretation is true only for single layer neural network. So if you are sh have a shallow neural network, it works. If you have deep neural networks, there is nothing like that. Uh, but I would just like to conclude with something else, uh, which is a bit more recent. So I told you before, you know, many problems like, for instance, Wasserstein-Gan 
corresponds to minimize some transportation cost. So you have probability measures, mu theta, which represent, which are indexed by this parameter theta. Theta is a very large dimensional parameter. You have a fixed measure mu. And then what you want to do is to minimize with respect to theta, the transportation cost between mu theta and mu. So you have to choose the theta so that mu theta is the closest as possible to mu. How do you do that? So how do you find this theta? Uh, this is challenging because this problem as a minimization problem in theta is not convex. So what happens when you minimize a non-convex problem is that you have many critical points, okay? So if you have a convex function and you try to find the minimum, there is a unique minimum, and this is the only point where the gradient of your function is zero. So there is only one critical point for a convex function, which is the set of minima. But for a non-convex function, there may be many mi local minima, there could be many critical points, and that makes this minimization challenging. How do I find this minimum? So what people do to find a minimum is run a gradient flow of the energy. Okay, so you have the energy, you start from some configuration, so you fix theta zero, time zero, and then you start to evolve theta in time, try to go down in the energy and try to find the best possible theta. I will show you in a video in a second uh, um, what I mean. And there is a, criti a critical idea that if you get stuck in this, min in this gradient flow, you should get, you will get stuck. Essentially, what happens? A gradient flow is looking at the, uh, um, is moving along the direction of the gradient of your energy. So it gradient flows get stuck every time you are at a critical point. So if you start at a critical point, which is perhaps not a minimum, you don't move. But if generically, if I just start from a random configuration and then move, I will never get stuck to a critical point, which is not stable because unstable critical points are points where I run away from. So let me try to explain this with uh, a video. Uh, so. I would like to discuss this. So this is a video from Marc Pelletier. So uh, look at this. I will stop it a second for you first. Um, you see there are two balls in this picture. So these are two initial configurations for your gradient flow. One ball starts from, uh, so the ball starts on top of two local mountains, let's say. You see where the minimum is, is this uh, you know blue deep area. And technically you would like to go there, right? So what do you do? You, you take some initial configuration, that, bit random, and then you start to move down, right? And you follow the gradient flow. So what you do is that you flow, you move along the direction where the landscape of your energy is going down. So you have to think that your energy, you can plot your energy functional. You start at some configuration where you have some certain energy, and then you look where you are in this, gra in this uh, landscape, and then you start to move in the direction where the, the energy is going down. Um, this is how you will go down from a mountain yourself. And uh, so you start, you see, you see you have two options perhaps or more, and then you see the, the bolts on the top are moving and, and the, the, on the top they're falling down to the right and the, there are others where, you know, the, and they get stuck. And some, and then other bolts, in fact, they go down and they reach the minimum. Okay, and here they are. So you see that depending where you start, you may get stuck in two different places. But in both cases here, they are critical. So in one case, it's the full minimum. The other case, the one to the right, you didn't get stuck at the minimum. The energy is rather high there still. But despite the energy being high, you see it, this is a local minimum. The, the shape is like the one of a, of a valley. You are in a region where you don't get out. You don't get stuck in general on a saddle point. So you don't get stuck in a situation where it's very easy to fall down. So the, the critical theoretical idea here is like, if you get stuck at a critical point, this critical point has to be stable because at an unstable critical point, the, you have zero probability to, to get stuck there, okay? And this is like the, the critical idea that we try to exploit in our um, research. So given that the idea is that points where the gradient flow could get stuck are stable, then maybe we can say something about stable critical points. So not in general. Of course, in general, there is no reason. Like the picture I gave you before, there, were, there was a stable critical point which, has a, which had a huge energy compared to the minimum. But perhaps in this particular configuration where you are minimizing trans optimal transport cost with respect to some training problem, blah, blah, blah. So in this particular optimal transport minimization problem, 
perhaps we can prove that stable critical points are very nice. In fact, all stable critical points are nice. They look almost like minima. They're not minima, but they look very similar. And perhaps you can prove that st every stable critical point has an energy which is not that far from the optimum. That was the critical the idea of our research. In fact, we could prove it very recently. Uh, still a work in process, progress with uh, Kentan Merigo and Filippo Sant'Ambrogio, that if you study the quantization problem, so if this mu minimum over theta of vastness and C mu theta new represent some kind of quantization problem, then in fact, stable kernel points do look similar to minima. And this is false for non-stable clear points. So you find unstable clear points, which are very, very far from minima. Uh, and this explains why algorithms work so well. It explains why even if you just if you put this these kind of problems in a computer, in reality they just converge super nicely despite being non-convex. Because in reality you never get stuck and you only get stuck at configuration which are almost minimum. Uh, okay, I think I took all the time I had, or probably even a bit more. So I would like to stop here and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prof Digali. We now invite Prof Yao to moderate the QA. Um, thank you, Professor Figali, for the fascinating talk. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Uh, the gentleman over there, please. Uh, thanks for the talk, Professor. I have a quick question about what do you think about, about learning and optimal transport? So people have been using uh, learning methods. I mean, people have been posing optimization problems as, as learning problems ever since learning got popular. And they do end up with solution, but it's mostly, at the end of the day, the problem can be solved with traditional solvers, and you can get the exact optimal solution using existing solvers, right? So uh, do you see a future where learning methods are going to be useful just beyond, let's say, heuristic development? Thank you. Sorry, can you just repeat the last So uh, are you learning see? methods uh, going to be useful anywhere just beyond, let's say, heuristic design for optimization problems? So like, are they going to be useful in, let's say, you coming up with new theoretical solutions or new algorithmic design? Uh, to get exact solutions. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a very good point, right? I mean, yes, uh, I think this is the goal, right? I mean, in the end, that's the long-term goal, but it's always between theoretical and computational solutions, there is always a big gap, I would say. And uh, um, this, uh, um, I mean, just, I think this last result that I showed uh, is like an example. I mean, I think, so the reason why we did, for instance, this kind of idea of looking at stable critical points and try to motivate that they're nicer than others um, um, came because we saw uh, that, that some algorithms that people were doing were working very well. So um, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, the, okay, there are many, many things here in this uh, uh, that one can think out of this, right? On one hand, I think this is nice because it, it says that very often uh, what you see in algorithms can motivate new theoretical results that then perhaps can justify what you see in algorithms and perhaps allow you to improve stuff. Um, here in optimal transport, it works other well in some situation. Uh, maybe one warning point that I would always like to make is that, you know, people ask me, okay, does it mean that you, I should use always optimal transport? Uh, I don't think that's true. Uh, I think that uh, there are situations where it works better then all their approaches more classical, and there are many situations where it doesn't work better, and then one should just stick to what people already use. Uh, so it's not like this is the you know the graal of all <laughs> problems, and then you can just use that and it will work. I think it's uh, just you know in some cases it works, some and others doesn't. Uh, but that's also the how mathematics and general research works. I mean there is no simple solution for everything, which is also why things are interesting, perhaps. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Maybe we can then move to the lady over there. Um, hi, Professor Vigeli. Um, thank you for your talk. Hello. Um, my name is Akshya, and I'm a PhD student from the University of Illinois. Um, I had a more general question um, about research in theory. So uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts or some advice for um, us researchers in theory uh, about how to keep motivation up where progress in terms of positive results is quite non-linear. We are just thinking about a problem for so long and then finally things fall into place. So, and when it doesn't happen for a long time, it can be quite demotivating. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. 
Oh, sure. Well, I think that goes a bit beyond the talk, of course, but I'm happy to give a quick answer. So uh, I think that's a part of the process that we all face as researchers. We are all in the same uh, boat. Uh, the, the time where we get stuck on a problem is way longer than the one way that we solve the problem because, you know, the solution usually gets quickly and then the frustration time is very long. So one has to find ways to cope with that. Um, so um, uh, my advice is, first of all, we all struggle, so don't take it personal. It's not that you're not good. It's like that, uh, it's just the problems are difficult and that's how our research progresses because we try to, ch to face challenging problems. Um, it's good sometimes to have something on the side, some other extra problems to work parallelly, especially if you get stuck for long and you need to clear out your brain. So you say, okay, now I'm really stuck on this. There is, I don't know, I'm not making progress. It doesn't make sense to hit the head over and over after so much time. Let me take a break. Let me try something else. And perhaps I come back to this. Um, this kind of, as much as possible, depends of course on the area of research, depends what you're doing. But in general, the fact of clearing the head and try to something different, go to something uh, different problem. Also work with collaborators with whom you can share your frustrations and <laughs> empathize. That helps a lot, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, for most of, I solved many problems in my career, but I have more problems that I couldn't solve than problems that I could solve. So that's a fact. And also, also when I solve them, I mean, there has never been a linear, a linear process. Usually you try, you get stuck, you give up. I gave up for problems over, uh, for like a year and a year and a half, and then I will go back again, try again, different approach, not working, leave again. And perhaps after, five, six, seven years, I could come up with the right solution. But it's also been lucky because you need the right idea at the right moment. So uh, it's a very tough thing. Uh, probably it's not discussed enough because probably we always have, we always have our pride and we don't want to share our weaknesses. <laughs> but uh, uh, there is nothing wrong with that. It's just normal. And I think the, it's good to, to have collaborators and it's good also to uh, not get too obsessed sometimes. A bit of obsession is necessary, but over obsession is not good. Perhaps it's good to take breaks on here and there when possible. That would be my quick tip. Thank you. Um, okay, maybe we can take two more questions from the live audience. So let's start from this gentleman and then we will move on here. Hi, uh, sorry, my question's also not about optimal transport. Uh, so I'm a biologist and I don't pretend to understand fully what uh, you're working on, but it's very interesting to see uh, your mathematical modeling of, uh, of the biological phenomenon that you showed. So unlike physics and chemistry, biology is one of those fields where we don't really have a lot of mathematical models to explain phenomena. And some physicists look down on biology as less of a science uh, because of that, which I mean, probably is fair. So my question is, is, is it like, uh, <laughs> That biology is just inherently so complex that it's hard to mathematize, or, or is it that there's been lack of an effort from both sides? Thank you. I think biology is extremely complex, of course. Uh, and, uh, you know, the farther you go, the more it's difficult sometimes to, to find a common ground to understand what's going on, right? So more and more now you see people, mathematicians with, you know, background in biology that do really math biology, and there is more and more communication. But this is more of a recent phenomenon in the last, I would say, 20 years. Uh, definitely biology, you know, is super complex. I mean, even, I mean, even from a practical viewpoint, you cannot really explain what's going on, right? Very often you have difficulties just to, you see evidences, but in some sense, you cannot, you don't know why this tumor developed. You don't know exactly what happened. And so you see that there are two layers, right? There is what's going on and then how you model that. And so this, this complexity is one of the main challenges. So uh, I think uh, that's why I think that we face, we struggle a lot, but the one good thing is that technology is gonna, I think is gonna help us more and more because for instance, I was telling you, for instance, if you want to use optimal transport to, to model this kind of cell genomics, um, then the question is, which cost do I use? And, you know, if just you ask someone, which cost do I use? I have no clue which cost you should use. And you would just try, I don't know, five random different costs and try something. Now what people have started to do is to use my artificial intelligence neural networks to model costs as well. So you mod, use that, to use a neural network not only to model what's going on, but also you can put the fam a family of costs inside the neural network. And then in the training process, you can train the cost itself. So now I think technology is going in a moment where it can help us 
to predict or to guess better what's going on, because in reality, there is no obvious theoretical way to just say, oh yeah, this is the, the question behind it, and this is why it's working this way. That is that we don't know. I mean, it's too complex. So uh, I think it would just take more time. And also, you know, for this, you also have to think, right? For physics, you could develop theories back even Newton. You didn't need much instruments, right, to do that. Uh, but biology, I mean, you need, uh, all, I mean, it's something where we could make process only recently in some sense, because the technology that you need, uh, the lab, all the experiments that you do, are, uh, I mean, they were way more difficult to do in the past. So, Wait, do you see it getting to a point where, uh, sorry, uh, do you see it getting to a point where we won't get criticized by physicists? Oh, but that's fine. I mean, I think like, you know, it's like within mathematics, you know, pure mathematicians say applied mathematicians are not the same. And then applied mathematicians look maybe on top, uh, look from above to a physicist and so on. I mean, that's just <laughs> how that is be, but you, should, you shouldn't just care about that. I mean, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, yeah, there is nothing wrong uh, about that. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Figali. Um, so due to the time constraint, uh, I'm afraid that we have to wrap up the Q&A session. Uh, thank you, Professor Figali, again for the wonderful talk, and thank you, everyone, for coming.